In my last video, I talked about the weirdest facts and stories from ancient Egypt, and I mentioned the pharaohs and the ungodly, well, technically it is godly, amount of power that they had. But as it turns out, giving humans the freedom and the money to do whatever they wanted to is never a good idea, especially during 3000 BC times, when things like human rights and basic freedoms were less like actual rules and more like the age confirmation on a porn website. This obviously led to these pharaohs getting up to a whole lot of shenanigans, and including them in my last video would have made it way too long. And what, you think I'm just gonna walk away from the chance to make another 10 minute video on the same topic? Who do you take me for? Some sort of person with integrity? So without further ado, let's talk about the pharaohs of ancient Egypt and the wackiest antics that they got up to. Now, out of all the ancient pharaohs, probably the most famous one of them all is Tutankhamun. I mean, pretty much everyone knows who this guy is, and if you don't, well, that's another point for me. This guy is the symbol of ancient Egypt now, but when King Tut was actually a pharaoh, he was honestly kind of a loser. I mean, he was kind of set up for failure from the beginning. His parents were brother and sister, so uh, let's just get that out of the way. This incestuous interloping led to Tutankhamun being born with a club foot and a bone disease called a vascular bone necrosis, which uh, you don't need to look up, just trust me on this one. This made it so that King Tut couldn't even walk normally and always had to use a cane, and his tomb even had a huge collection of canes and walking sticks, because apparently being an all-powerful god still isn't enough to fix your fucked up incest feed. Tutankhamun also had some heart problems and had a parasite in him that gave him severe malaria. To add to all this, he became the pharaoh when he was just 9 years old, so to say that life dealt him a bad hand is kind of an understatement. As you can imagine, he wasn't an exceptional leader or anything, and he only stayed pharaoh for 9 years until his death in 1325 BC. So the guy was born with a bunch of problems and died really early, and everyone forgot about him pretty quickly. And that was the end of that. But the things that made him a loser in the past are the exact things that led to him becoming popular today. How the turns have tabled indeed. Now most pharaohs were expected to last a lot longer than 18 years, what with them being literal gods and all. And so by the time Tutankhamun died, the Egyptians didn't have a proper royal tomb ready for him to be buried in. And according to the Egyptians, you only had 70 days to bury someone after they died. So they just said fuck it and tossed him in some random, non-royal tomb instead. King Tut also didn't do anything that interesting during his rule, so most people kinda just forgot about him soon after he died. Plus, his tomb was located near some bigger and more visible tombs and was covered up by debris and the houses of workers who built those tombs. In fact, the tomb was so invisible that the person who discovered it, Howard Carter, did it completely on accident. Now all this might just seem like sprinkling salt into the gaping festering wound that is King Tut's life, but by having such a low profile, Tutankhamun was able to keep his tomb safe from the biggest problem that almost every single other pharaoh had to deal with after they died, grave robbers. The tombs of pharaohs were usually filled with expensive jewellery, ornaments and entire coffins made up of gold and other fancy materials, and as it turns out, most people couldn't care less about respecting the dead when there's millions of dollars on the line. Who would have thought? By the time we got around to discovering them, most of the pharaoh's tombs were already robbed centuries ago and we never got to see the cool stuff that they actually contained. But since King Tut wasn't that famous and his tomb was hidden, most of the stuff there was preserved and so when we finally found it, it blew everyone away. I mean, it's not every day that you find a giant pile of untouched gold and gems in the middle of Egypt, let alone a pile that has stayed untouched for 3000 years of history. The tomb also contained the perfectly preserved body of King Tut which was also important, but definitely a lot harder to look at. The discovery of the tomb was, obviously, front page news, and this led to King Tut becoming famous all around the world, all because he was so forgettable when he lived. So just remember, if you ever feel worthless and ignored, just make sure to bury yourself underground with tons of gold at the age of 18, and you will have guaranteed fame 3000 years later. Our next pharaoh is a guy named Pepe II. He was born around 2284 BC. And when he was 6 years old, his brother, who was the pharaoh at the time, passed away. Now going to such a tragedy at a young age is obviously a very stressful process, and the Egyptians made sure to break the news to Pepe in the most tasteful way possible. Hey kid, I have some bad news to tell you. Your brother, he passed away this morning. What? Yeah, you, your brother, he was a great man. I, and I know this is a lot to take in, and I know a lot of things are probably going on in your mind right now. And to help you get through this tragedy, we thought we'd make you in charge of the entire country. That's right, kid. A million people's lives are entirely in your hands. 
there's people starving out there and their deaths are gonna be your fault and you better not mess this up because this empire is a thousand years old and trust me you do not want to be the guy who ruined a thousand year old empire do i make myself clear y yes yes you do great see i always knew you were a smart kid anyways if you need any help i'll just be down the hall have fun so, at the ripe old age of 6, Pepi II became the pharaoh of Egypt. Now, although he might have been slightly underqualified for the job, he was having a lot more fun than you might think. All the boring, taking care of the country stuff was handled by his mother and uncle, and all he had to do was wear a bunch of jewellery and look pretty for the papyrus. And since he was technically a pharaoh, he could do pretty much whatever he wanted, which is a very dangerous power to give to a 6 year old. So as you can imagine, Pepi had a very spoiled childhood. And there's no better example of this than his obsession with a certain dwarf. Pepi had previously sent a team on an expedition to a region near Egypt called Nubia with this guy, Harkov, as a leader. Now the expedition's goal was to find and trade precious resources like ivory for the empire. As you can tell, very serious business. While on the expedition, Harkov found a really short guy who could dance real good. Wow, that sure is interesting, thought Harkov. I guess I'll mention it in my letter to Pepi but it's really not that important. And so, Harkov went on with his day. But he apparently forgot that Pepe was, and let me reiterate this, an actual first grader. And seeing a short guy dance really good would probably blow his small, underdeveloped mind. As soon as Pepe heard about the dwarf, he immediately wrote back to Harkov, telling him to bring the dwarf back to his palace as soon as possible. Now in today's world, kidnapping someone for your own personal entertainment would probably raise a few eyebrows at least. But again, all human rights went out the window when he put six-year-old and ultimate power in the same sentence. Pepe gave very specific instructions to Harkov on how the dwarf would be transported. He wanted reliable people to constantly watch the dwarf on the ship just in case he fell into the water. He also wanted people to sleep next to the dwarf throughout the night. And he wanted the dwarf to be inspected ten times every night. Now I'm pretty sure you don't need an entire army of people to guard a short guy who can dance real good. But Pepe was taking no chances with this one. The dwarf was eventually brought back to the royal palace and from then on, Pepe could enjoy some sick moves from a vertically challenged guy whenever he wanted to. Clearly a leader who really cares about his nation. The next pharaoh on our list is a guy named Akhenaten. He was initially called Amenhotep IV and at the time, the people of Egypt worshipped a bunch of gods and goddesses. Amenhotep was fine with that and it was all going smoothly until around 5 years into his rule when he suddenly snapped and went you know what, screw this, screw you, and screw Egypt. Your shoes are whack, your gods are fake, I'm gonna change my name and worship the sun god. Sir, so, this is a Wendy's. Amenhotep suddenly decided that the sun god, Aten, was the only god that should be worshipped in Egypt. He changed his name to Akhenaten, and he made sure that the people weren't praying to anything else. And when I say made sure, I mean he really went all in. He destroyed the temples of all the other gods and removed their names from inscriptions. He banned people from wearing anything with the images of the other gods. He even removed the word gods from the inscriptions because it was plural. Akhenaten had found his waifu and he was gonna make sure that everyone respected it. In fact, Akhenaten went a step further and decided to build an entire new city just for the sun god. He named the city Akhetaten, real creative there buddy, and he wanted it to be the new capital of Egypt which, historically speaking, is a terrible idea. The city itself though was actually quite nice. It had some cool temples and a palace, and it probably would have been pretty good to live in, if you were rich that is. The wealthy elite, which included Akhenaten, had their own area in the city with large houses and buildings surrounded by a high wall to keep out the filthy peasants, who lived in cramped houses nearby. But the real kicker was how the city was built. The whole thing was completed in just four years, and cemeteries and graves found near the city contained a whole bunch of bodies with some interesting features, like broken bones, or in some cases, broken spinal cords. The exact kind of injuries you'd get when you're doing hard manual labor, like, I don't know, building a brand new city from scratch. Now I'm not saying that Akhenaten forced a bunch of people, some of which were children, to build a new city for him until all their bones turned to dust. All I'm saying is that a city doesn't just build itself up that quickly without at least a few human rights violations along the way. Now telling an entire country of people that their gods were fake and then forcing them to move to a new, shittier capital is not exactly something that makes you very popular. And unsurprisingly, most of Egypt hated Akhenaten. As soon as he died, Egypt immediately went back to worshipping multiple gods. 
and just 15 years after the city was founded, Akhetaten was completely abandoned. His sarcophagus and tomb were vandalized, the temples he built were destroyed, and his name was eventually erased from official lists. And that's the story of Akhenaten, the guy who was so bad at his job that an entire country of people pretended he never existed. Our next story comes from a guy named Amasis II. Now this guy wasn't the son of the pharaoh or even related to the royal family at all. He was just an officer in the Egyptian army, but the guy knew how to hustle. He might have just been a regular dude, but he had big plans to become the pharaoh of Egypt, and he got his chance in 567 BC. A bunch of Egyptian soldiers who lost a war in Libya were returning home when they decided to revolt against the pharaoh at the time, a priest. So, Amasis was sent to Libya to handle the situation and stop the rebellion. Hello Egyptian soldiers, my name is Amasis and I've been told that there's some sort of rebellion going on here. Now I understand that they're all angry and upset and that's why the pharaoh has sent me here to... Wait, is that the Horus 226 chariot with advanced steering control? Yep, the one and only. And is that the Anubis bow and arrow system? It sure is. Anyway. Why did the pharaoh send you all the way out here? The pharaoh... Psh, that guy? Who cares about that guy? Barely even know him. A completely unrelated, but do you guys need someone to be the leader of this little rebellion here? Yeah, actually, we do need a leader. Perfect, yeah, you know what? I'll be your leader. I'll take that and that. I just hate the pharaoh so much. You're wearing the pharaoh's uniform. This? Nah, nah, it, it, was, it was all a trick. I tricked you. Aha, uh -huh. see, I've been with you guys all along. Don't worry about it. Anyway, let's go kill that pharaoh that we all hate so much. Now, I don't know how those soldiers thought that the random guy who appeared out of nowhere in the middle of the desert should be their leader, but somehow, Amasis convinced them that he was on their side. He led these soldiers all the way to Egypt, where they easily defeated a priest and his tiny army. A priest was killed soon after this, and just to add insult to injury, Amasis married a priest's daughter whose name I'm scared to even try to pronounce, thereby becoming part of the royal family and the new pharaoh of Egypt. Nothing like a good underdog story to round off this whole video. So yeah, those were some of the wackiest pharaohs of ancient Egypt. Like the video if you liked it, subscribe, hit the bell, leave a comment and watch another video by clicking right here. I'll see you guys later. I got